If you don't like Ocean's Eleven, then fuck you. In your eyes, what is a perfect movie? For me, it will always be 2001 Ocean's Eleven, and no, not the one from 1960. So what's for you to be funny, Ocean? You should be ashamed of yourself enticing a broken arm man into a project of such precision. You know what your problem is? You underestimate people. Louis, grab it. <laughs> what? What? What's that with a broken arm? Why, well, shucks, Master Seedmus, it's all healed now. <laughs> I don't really care how iconic or memorable that movie or its cast is. It stinks. There are a handful of movies I would put in the category of perfection, right? The Godfather, Empire Strikes Back, Goodfellas, Superbad. It's all personal opinion, don't get me wrong. But those to me are the best of the best for their respective genres. Now I'm not comparing Ocean's Eleven to those movies. Don't get me wrong, they don't really, it doesn't match them in terms of relevance to society or importance or overall quality. But when it comes to what Ocean's Eleven offers up, I consider it to be perfect. Ocean's Eleven is a movie centered around fun and camaraderie. It never crosses the line into being too serious or trying to harp on some sort of message or do too much. And you know what? Sometimes with movies, that is okay. There's no big drama. No one's mom dies. And no breakups. You know, nothing like that. It's just guys with the banter bringing down the casino. A nice suit here and there. There's just something so inherently cool about Ocean's Eleven. From the way people talk, to the way they dress, and even the way they walk around. Plus, come on, it's Las Vegas. Las Vegas is awesome. Everything is so inviting about Ocean's Eleven. The vibe of the movie is what makes it so engaging. Director Steven Soderbergh's fast-paced style is as present as ever with Ocean's Eleven. Even in the few grounded, more somber scenes, the dialogue and character interactions, they're quick. They never really allow the audience to disengage. You're out. The prison. You remember the day that I went for cigarettes and didn't come back? You must have noticed. I don't smoke, don't sit. There are plenty of heist movies, especially from Steven Soderbergh. Look at Logan Lucky, but none of them have the swagger that Ocean's Eleven has. The ease of which everything is executed and performed by Danny, Rusty, and the rest of the crew adds so much to that coolness factor, you know? The poker scene from the beginning of the movie might be the best example. Danny Walt is out of jail, right into a game of poker between Rusty and a bunch of early 2000s TV stars, and without saying anything more than a few comments and just a couple visual cues, they pull off their first heist. But I'm staying in. He's trying to buy his way out of his bluff. Josh? Two. Uh. All right. Girl. Call. 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 Let's see him. I'm not sure what the four nines does, but the ace I think is pretty high. Dude. <clears throat> Thanks for the tip on calling out the bluff. It was as simple as that, and the ease in which they pull something together perfectly, it really establishes the tone and the rhythm for the rest of the movie. One of the most impressive parts of Ocean's Eleven is that Soderbergh is able to introduce so many characters and still find a way to flesh them out and make them all so memorable. Not only that, they're all just damn likable, which is saying something because they're thieves. I dare you to find more likable anti-heroes from any movie. Everyone knows someone like George Clooney's Danny Ocean. Maybe not to the stature of Danny, but he's the guy who knows everyone. He has a calming presence. He pulls everyone together. He has the occasional great speech. Because the house always wins. You play long enough, you never change the stakes. The house takes you. Unless, when that perfect hand comes along, you bet big, and then you take the house. I've been practicing this speech a little bit. Did I rush it? It felt like I rushed it. That was good. I liked it. And no matter what, he almost always finds a way to end up on the positive side of things. You want to be friends with Danny, plain and simple. Brad Pitt's Rusty might be my favorite movie character of all time. Nobody's as cool as Rusty. Nothing faces him. He's usually the smartest and the wittiest guy in the room. How's the game going? Longest hour of my life. Running away with your wife. Great. The amount of food he eats in the movie is also fucking incredible.
We're gonna meet that cheeseburger. You know who else eats cheeseburgers like that with the wrapper on? That's right, Tony Stark. Brad Pitt's best characters, at least in my eyes, all have the same cocky, confident, and snarky demeanor to them. Also, worth noting, he actually wears Austin Powers' wig in a scene. That's right, Mike Myers used that wig in rehearsals for Austin Powers. Uh, Rusty is slick. He knows it, and everyone wants to be Rusty. Bernie Mac, first off, rest in peace, does a great job with Frank Catton at helping set up the slippery inside world of Las Vegas, casinos, and Danny Ocean's connections. He also supplies one of the best moments in the movie. You heard what I said. Black man can't earn a decent wage in this state. That is absolutely a like you gonna try to throw me sir. out on the street? No, no one's throwing. I'm trying to do my job, yeah, sir. Do your job. What you want from me, man? Want me to get on the table and dance? You like me to shine your shoes? Want me to smile at you? But you definitely won't let me deal the cars. You might as well call it White Jack. Bingo. Elliot Gould as Ruben, rich asshole. No denying that. You're Bobby Caldwell's kid, huh? From Chicago? Yeah. It's nice there. Do you like it? Yeah. That's wonderful. Get in the goddamn house. And I don't think the character would deny it either. He sets a tone for the type of people at the top in Las Vegas. Just look at how he stands there with that fucking cigar and smoking jacket. While the whole movie is filled with comedy, the two big reliefs in that sense are obviously the Malloy brothers. Fun fact. They're actually supposed to be played by Luke and Owen Wilson. And then after that, the Coen brothers, before we finally got Casey Affleck and Scott Kahn. The do-it-all guys in the movie, these two, they add the right amount of chaos to the planning and the heist. Livingston Dell, played by Eddie Jemison, who I'm pretty sure I saw in a bagel shop once. Uh, he's the character that keeps everything just a little grounded, right? Not everything can go without a hitch, and watching him sweat it out adds enough to keep it from being too squeaky clean. I scoff at anyone who doesn't love Don Cheadle's British accent for Basher Tar. Poxy Demo crew haven't used the coaxial inch to back the main line, have they? They've only nosed up the mainframe couplet, nosed it right up! How can you not love that? And while Ocean's Eleven doesn't really pack violence, every heist movie needs an ammunition guy who's going to make things go boom now and then. Quietly, some of the best comedy Ocean's Eleven actually comes from Shaobo Kin's Amazing Yen. Amazing. How's that feel? You all right? You want something to read? Magazine? All right. What the fuck you bet? It's quick, but Basher's reaction to Rusty understanding Yen is outstanding. No, tunneling is out. Their sensors monitoring the ground 100 yards in every direction. If a groundhog were to nest there, they'd know about it. Anyone else? You said something about good. Carl Reiner's Saul Bloom is a really important character for me because I think he best relates to the audience. He's skeptical throughout the entire movie. Saul asks the questions the audience asks as they're watching, just like during the scene where Danny explains the elaborate heist. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Say we get into the cage and, and through the security doors there and down the elevator we can't move and past the guards with the guns and into the vault we can't open. Without being seen by the cameras. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, well, say we do all that. Uh, we're just supposed to walk out of there with $150 million in cash on us without getting stopped? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Pretty good foreshadowing at the end there, actually. The down-on-your-luck nature of the characters is key in making the anti-heroes relatable, and the racing scene with Saul, a terrible gambler, does a great job at laying that out there right at the end. Is that your hound way in the rear there? He breaks late. Everyone knows this. The last part of the crew is Matt Damon himself, as Linus Caldwell. The role was originally supposed to be played by Mark Wahlberg. But he turned the movie down to play. The powerful rule by fear. Next you'll be telling us these beasts have a soul. <laughs> Is there a soul in there? Kill them all. If you have time to waste, uh, and I mean time to waste, go back and watch the Mark Wahlberg Planet of the Apes. It is so, so bad. 
Soderbergh adds a wild card to the crew with Linus. You never truly know what you're going to get with him because despite his advanced pickpocketing and sleight of hand skills, the biggest tension in the movie comes from wondering if he has what it takes to keep the heist working. You've been at the commission long? Yeah, about 18 months. And you know how Lindley over there worked with him at all? Not since he died last year. He isn't quite as polished as the rest of the crew. Don't touch your tie. Look at me. Okay. I ask you a question. You have to think of the answer. Where do you look? No good. You look down, they know you're lying. And up, they know you don't know the truth. But he's quiet and mysterious, which is painted wonderfully here in the Las Vegas strip demolition scene. Just an incredible shot from Soderbergh there. There's Linus just standing there looking on at Danny. We think he might be dumb, but he is on the tail of the smartest man in Vegas right there, and all this makes him unpredictable and the ideal final piece to the puzzle. And it really is the perfect puzzle. It helps that big stars were cast in the roles, but Danny and his crew could not have been put together any better. But none of this is complete without two more people added on top of this. While there were a few variables at play within the crew that could disrupt the apple cart, Danny needs a real wrench in the plans, and that is what he has with Tess. Julia Roberts brings an elegance to Danny's ex-wife and does something in the movie that no one else can achieve, throw Danny off his game. While it all ends up working out in the end, like it plays into his master plan, Danny's only real cracks appear whenever Tess is around. For a man who knows everyone and has the means to have it all, he only really wants one thing. And finally, the man who finds a way to be worse than the thieves themselves, Terry Benedict. Terry Benedict is such an evil sounding name too. Really nailed it on that one. Benedict's stoic presence dominates any scene he's in. He thinks he is better than you and everyone knows it, except for Danny. It's a wonderfully crafted villain as Andy Garcia brings a monotonous feel to the role. Benedict is ruthless and you know that just by looking at him. Even if Danny and his crew weren't so enjoyable, you still have a hard time rooting for Terry Benedict. He's an understated yet intimidating villain, and just look at the way he hits the button on an elevator. Just like, I'm telling you, like, punch an elevator button, it's, it's a very liberating feeling. You, you, feel, you feel like you have some power there. They all complement each other really well, and Soderbergh does an amazing job at immersing you in all of the characters' personalities, and doing so in a style and at a speed that doesn't drag the movie down at all. I could stop with the characters alone, making this a perfect movie, but I won't. Everything about Ocean's Eleven is so intricate and smart. There's a ton of foreshadowing, both big. We need to build an exact working replica of the Bellagio Vault for practice. Something like that. And of course, small. Safety is confirmed. You will get your vault back. The movie leads you to believe that Danny's fake out is the big twist, only to pull off one last big bang with one of the greatest moments in movie history, the revealing of the heist. I don't understand. What happened to all that money? It's such an incredible oh shit moment. Everything in it, every beat, every reveal just blows you away. And to this day, 20 years later, I still smile every time Rusty flips up the SWAT team helmet shield. It's just amazing. And you know, for the most part in heist movies, they're gonna get the money, right? They're gonna get what they want, but Ocean's Eleven still finds a way to blow you away. This is really part of what helps it hold up and achieve a perfect status in my eyes. It never gets old. The big moment is always fresh and fun for me. And the music is also a big part of it as well. If you go to Las Vegas and you're not humming some of the music from Ocean's Eleven, whether it's Elvis or something from the score, what are you even doing? With that said, arguably the best music moment comes at the end of the movie, in front of the Bellagio Fountains.
With Claire de Lune playing, each character gets their smile and their story arc pay off one by one. Soderbergh ties such a nice bow on the end of the movie with the fountains exploding as the crew departs. Now, when it comes to the sequels, I don't mind them, but I also don't really like them all that much. They do a decent job because Soderbergh couldn't just recreate Ocean's Eleven, but the fun had in the first movie isn't quite there like it is with the others. I think 12 and 13 are missing many of the subtle, small moments that make Eleven so great. No, no, I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't okay, mean. Okay, okay, come on, sit down. Sit down. You better talk to him. He's got it. Hello? Um, hello? Marcus? No, it's um, Julia. She's Who's this? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's Julia. I'm with Bruce Willis. You're with Bruce right now. Could I, can I speak with him? Oh, yes, to little SpongeBob. I, I, uh, I'm sorry, can I just talk to him for a second? Did it drop out? Lose yeah. it? Yes. yes. It, it uh, fell out. The Las Vegas element adds such a larger than life feeling as well. And while they do return there for 13, the Heisen reveals in that movie, they don't really pack the same charm or punch. I could watch Ocean's Eleven every day. I could watch it every day for the rest of my life. It's that great in my eyes. It is my number one desert island movie. Great characters, great story. One of the most creative movies you'll ever see. To me, Ocean's Eleven, perfect movie. Hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to give it a like, that thumbs up button, and to subscribe to our channel. And let us know in the comments below what your one, just pick one, one perfect movie is and also in the links below you can rate all 2019 movies for our movie rating database thanks for watching we'll talk to you next time